very, very honored that we have with us this evening, I think one of the brightest, most thoughtful individuals in the space in which he excels. I have made my way through fire shut up in my bones. And as I said to Charles earlier, he and I actually have a lot in common in terms of the way we grew up. Uh, he in rural Louisiana, I in rural Alabama. But if you haven't read this, I really commend it to you because it is a truly remarkable autobiography. Charles Blow is the visual op-ed columnist now for the New York Times, where he's been for the last 22 years. His column appears every Monday and Thursday in the Times. And I have to say that the column that appeared recently as the basket of whomever uh, was a very, very deep piece of commentary. And that appeared on Monday, and I made my way through that. But his, his columns, uh, they, they, they tackle these hot-button issues. He's not afraid to go there. He's not afraid to tackle issues of teen pregnancy and the national debt and the presidential race and gender roles and gay rights. He's not afraid to go there. He joined the Times in 1994 as the paper's graphics editor. And during his tenure, he led the publication to win awards for work that included its information graphics coverage of 9-11 and also the Iraq War. Uh, Charles is a CNN commentator and contributor, as you know, and he also appears on every other network um, out there, MSNBC. You often see him on Morning Joe. He has appeared on the Andrea Mitchell Reports, uh, Heartball with Chris Matthews, CNN American Morning, um, the Joy um, uh, 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 Bahar Show, uh, Fox News and Friends. I mean, if you're turning on the TV and you're looking for serious commentary, uh, you see Charles Blow. And so, um, Mr. Blow understands as well the great tradition of HBCUs. He is a magna cum laude graduate of Gramlin State University, where he received his BA in communications, and he lives in Brooklyn, New York, with his three children. But ladies and gentlemen, please join me this evening in welcoming one of the greatest thought leaders of our times, Mr. Charles Blow from the New York Times. Thank you so much. Am I, is good? We can hear, great. I can move this out of the way. Um, thanks for being here, and thanks for inviting me. Um, what Wickham didn't tell you about that trip that we took to Selma with the president is that when we got off the, the, the van, when we got to Selma, I was lollygagging, and I got left in Selma. Right? <laughs> there, was, there, there was no way to get out of there. And I said, Wickham, listen, don't leave me. You know, he, they were like, listen, you better keep up. And I didn't keep up. I had to drive to Atlanta to get out of there. <clears throat> anyway, so what we're going to do here today, I mean, we have, this is my first time at Morgan State. We have so much to talk about. So I want to leave enough space to talk about everything. But for my prepared remarks, I have to talk about this election because it is absolutely insane. Yes, yes. Right? Let me start with a story, because I am now experiencing a profound sense of deja vu. One of the first elections I ever voted in was eerily similar to this presidential race, only the candidates were more flawed, and the election was even more of a circus. I know that's hard to believe, but it's actually true. The Democrat, who had occupied the white columned home of the executive during a prior period of prosperity, had testified more than 15 times before a grand jury investigation investigating him and had twice been tried but never convicted on felony charges. The Republican, a divorcee, was a well-known racist and demagogue who tried to disavow his past and who once said his plan to deal with illegal immigrants immigration was to heavily fortify the Mexican-American border and round up and deport all illegal aliens. 
As Newsweek noted at the time, the Republican was attempting to run from his past by repackaging himself as a populist. His affable game show host looks and just folks manner have been insidiously successful in blunting the impact of a past pocked with racism, Jew-hating, and revisionism. The magazine wrote that for thousands of, quote, whites, whites angry with hard times and high taxes, his is the ultimate noble campaign. His coded distillations of white economic and racial resentment are by, are by now the most thoroughly decoded in American politics. The New York Times reported at the time that the Republicans, quote, evolution from a lifetime of the fringes of racial politics to a new life as an aspiring national politician is largely the result of his symbiotic relationship with broadcast journalism. A Democratic leader complained about the media's role in the Republicans' ascendance, saying the media have made him a legitimate candidate. The venerable Ted Koppel said at the time that television and the Republican candidate were made for each other. Is any of this sounding familiar? A former newspaper editor called the Republican support impenetrable, cautioning that the Democrat depended on winning over members of his own party who had recently despised him. Some in the polling and pundit class even worried about a hidden vote for the Republican, which would come from a group who wouldn't publicly say they supported him, but would vote for him on election day. There was lingering questions about the sincerity of the Republicans' recently professed Christianity. Writing about one of the Republicans' previous races, the author Tyler Briggs said that at his rally, supporters were angry and they thrust their fists in the air and stomped their feet and chanted his name over and over. Briggs wrote that the rallies had an us versus them atmosphere in which supporters frequently heckled reporters. One of the most memorable bumper stickers from that campaign was for the Democrat and read, vote for the crook, it's important. Ironically, both candidates would later be convict convicted of crimes following FBI investigations. The year of that election was 1991. I was a college student about the same age as many of you in this room at Grambling in my home state of Louisiana. And the race was a gubernatorial runoff between the Democrat Edwin Edwards, who reportedly once counseled Bill Clinton on how to deal with the Jennifer Flowers scandal, and the Republican David Duke, a former Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, who this year endorsed Donald Trump. It was the first gubernatorial election in which I voted. Indeed, Edwards was so brazen and unrepentant as a skirt chaser that he joked to a reporter during that, that campaign about the similarities between him and Duke. He said, the only thing that we have in common is that we're both wizards under the sheets. People called it the election from hell or the race from hell, depending on who you were talking to. In the end, Edwards won with a coalition of blacks and affluent business-oriented conservatives in a record turnout for a state gubernatorial general election. I'm recalling that now because the current race is also being framed by the political media as a choice between two equivalent evils, between a crooked Hillary and a bigoted Trump. But this idea that they are equally flawed and equally bad is a logical fallacy created by and propagated by a lazy media that always prefers a tight race to the alternative. One of these candidates is a lifelong record of public service, including holding public office, and the other 
has a lifelong record of bombast and agitation, a record of saying the most vile and despicable things about minorities and women and anyone with whom he disagreed and a history of discrimination. These two people are not simply two sides of the same coin. It is impossible to see it that way. You can review Clinton's history of service and find it disturbing, absolutely. It is fair and right to question Clinton's record on her role in advocating for the disastrous 1994 crime bill that helped America to gain the dubious distinction of having the world's highest incarceration rate. It is right and fair to question her record and role in the 1996 welfare reform bill. It is right and fair to question her record and comments calling some children super predators and accepting donations from pri the private prison industry. It is right and fair to question her record of being a military hawk and voting for the Iraq war. There can be no sacred cows when some people have been treated as sacrificial lambs. Your assessment may be that the bad outweighs the good and that decision is yours to make as an informed voter. But at least for Clinton, there is a record to question. And it is one that deals with policy. At least she is a serious candidate. Trump, on the other hand, simply is not. He is a national and international embarrassment. He is a disgrace and a hypocrite engaging in an elaborate campaign of deflection, accusing his opponent of the very thing for which he is guilty. Trump calls Clinton a liar, but this is the same man for whom fact, the fact-checking website PolitiFact found that only 4% of the statements they checked that belonged to him were completely true. This is the same person for whom that website named his collection of campaign misstatements the 2015 lie of the year. What they wrote is, quote, it's the trope on Trump. He's authentic and a straight talker, less scripted than traditional politicians. That's because Donald Trump doesn't let the facts slow him down. <laughs> Bending the truth or being unhampered by accuracy is a strategy he follows and has followed for years. This is the same man whose ghostwriter for the book, The Art of the Deal, said, he lies strategically. He had a complete lack of conscience about it. Since most people are constrained by the truth, Trump's indifference to it gave him a strange advantage. Trump attacks Clinton for a lack of transparency, but this is the same man who has yet to release his tax returns, something no presidential candidate has failed to do in modern American politics and who is telling a flat out lie when he says the reason he cannot do it. <laughs> this is the same man who has released less information about his physical health than any other candidate, instead issuing a laughable doctor's note. And today I guess he went on Dr. Oz and said he had a checkup. <laughs> this is the same man who brags about his generosity and his charitable giving, but whose actual giving no one can find and pin down. Trump calls on Clinton to apologize for her baskets of deplorables comments, but this is the same man who has never apologized for anything and says that he has never even needed to seek forgiveness from God. This is the same man who has called women fat pigs and dogs and slobs and disgusting animals. This is the same man who has called many Mexican 
immigrants, rapists, and murderers. Trump says he loves the veterans, but this is the same man who received five draft deferments from the Vietnam War, one of them for bone spurs in his heel. This is the same man who in 1991 wrote a harsh letter to the New York State Assembly to stop veterans from being vendors on the street near his ritzy apartment tower on Fifth Avenue in New York. The veterans are allowed to do that by a law dating back to the 19th century. It was basically a law written to benefit injured soldiers coming back from the Civil War. In the letter, what did Trump call the situations with the veterans? That's right, deplorable. This is the same man who has attacked a Gold Star family whose son was slain in Iraq. Trump calls Clinton crooked, but this is the same man who along with his businesses has been sued over 1,300 times. This is the same man who at this very moment is subject to three class action lawsuits over the, sh the sham, I can't even get it out, the sham <laughs> that is Trump University. Two of them in California and one in New York. This is the same man who bucking presidential conventions because I have to say this one more time, has yet to release his taxes. Trump calls the Clinton Foundation the most corrupt enterprise in political history, but this is the same man who donated $100,000 to the Clinton Foundation. This is the same man whose own foundation, the Trump Foundation, has recently been accused by news reports of being a slush fund for his political endeavors. In fact, the New York Attorney General has opened an inquiry into tr the Trump Foundation and its operations following those news reports. Trump says Clinton is trigger happy but this is the same man who called for the execution of the Central Park Five and Edward Snowden and whose advisors, one of his advisors, has even called for the execution of Hillary Clinton herself. This is the same man who called for the U.S. military to take out the families of suspected terrorists. This is the same man who has talked incredibly, recklessly, about the use of nuclear weapons. But perhaps most cynically, Trump says Democrats have failed and betrayed African Americans in his fake last minute outreach to black people, which is in fact simply a way of using black people as pawns and photo ops in his quest to win college-educated white women's votes because those women are unlikely to vote for him because they are likely to recoil from a man who they believe is a bigot. This is the same man who in the whole of his 70 years on this earth has no demonstrable record of prior outreach to the black community at all. To the contrary, this is a man who became the grand wizard of birtherism against President Obama. This is a man who the same day as he started his fake black outreach, hired as his campaign chief executive, a man named Steve Bannon, the executive chairman of Breitbart News. This is the same Breitbart that the Southern Poverty Law Center referred to in an April hate watch report, saying over the past year, however, the outlet has undergone a noticeable shift towards embracing ideas on the, of the extremist 
fringe of the conservative right, racist ideas, anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant ideas, all key tenets making up an emerging racist ideology known as the alt-right. The report continued, the alt-right is a loose set of far-right ideologies at the core of which is a belief that white identity is under attack through policies prioritizing multiculturalism, political correctness, and social justice, and must be preserved, usually through white-identified online communities and physical ethnostates. This is the same man who, according to his 1991 book, Trumped, the inside story of the real Donald Trump, his cunning rise and spectacular fall, once said, I've got black accountants at Trump Castle and at Trump Plaza. Black guys counting my money. I hate it. The only people I want counting my money are short guys that wear yarmulkes all day. That was a twofer. <laughs> Racist against black people and anti-Semitic all in one shot. This is the same man who has so maligned Mexicans and slandered Muslims, who has treated women with disdain, who has mocked the handicapped, who has applauded dictators, who has encouraged the assault of protesters at his rallies. And if there is one thing that the history of being black in America has taught us, it is that all intolerances and bigotries are cousins. Once you establish in your mind a hierarchy of humanity, once you are able to assign one group to a lower status, you are capable of assigning any group to a lower status. But black people see Donald Trump. More precisely, they see through Donald Trump. As James Baldwin once put it, of all Americans, Negroes distrust politicians most, or more accurately, they have been best trained to expect nothing from them. More than other Americans, they are always aware of the enormous gap between election promises in their daily lives. Baldwin continued, our people have functioned in this country for nearly a century as political weapons the trump card up the enemy's sleeve. Anything promised Negroes at election time is also a threat level against his opponent. In the struggle for, the, for mastery, the Negro is the pawn. There are no perfect candidates, but these candidates are not equally imperfect. Donald Trump is a bigot. <laughs> that is not a media fairy tale or a media narrative. That is an absolute truth. No one manufactured Donald Trump's bigotry. Donald Trump manifests his own bigotry. He is a reprobate and a charlatan who has ridden a wave of intolerance to its crest. Yes. This election cycle, America stands at the precipice. And ironically, it may, may be America's darker children, those who this country has sometimes disdained, those who, those who Trump himself has sometimes disdained who may come to America's rescue. The great irony is that the people who have been subject to some of the greatest oppression in this country may be the very ones who save it. Because as Langston Hughes wrote, we too sing America. Thank you very much. Blow has agreed to take questions. Uh, we have mics set up in aisles left and aisles right, and I would uh, encourage you to step forward to the mics if you have a question. 
And while you do that, I want to open this up with a question of my own. Oh, okay. Uh, you have painted a picture of Donald Trump that the thinking person might say reveals him as a bigot, as despicable, deplorable, and someone unfit not only to be president of the United States, but to even hold the Republican Party's presidential nomination. Yet today, a CNN poll reveals that the gap nationally between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump is closing, and the polls in the battleground states of Ohio and Florida indicate a close, close race. Why is that? <laughs> it is clear to me that um, as Mark Twain once said, no man can be comfortable without his own approval. No person who holds a bigoted position, uh, a sexist position, a uh, xenophobic position, can do so and not feel comfortable in that position. So we construct around ourselves a way to make ourselves feel comfortable even in our intolerance. That is why when people say, this is a problem, it sometimes jolts people because to them, they have made themselves so comfortable with the notion that it is okay, that they cannot accept your telling them that it is not okay, that there is an absolute here, and that, and that to categorize people by race and to say that some are better than others and that, that, that God ultimately, as Martin Luther King said, made a mistake and permanently assign some racial groups to a lower class is simply false. That your constructions, however you have informed them around race and sex and gender and identity, if you are, if you are creating a hierarchy of that, then that is simply false. People make themselves comfortable, and what you're seeing is people making themselves comfortable with the idea that, that this man is normalizing what they believe is already true for them. So in a way, what, every time I try to write about this and I talk about this, I try to make sure that I explain to people there is no way to support, intolerant, to, to support intolerance and not be intolerant yourself. There is no in-between space. This is a binary proposition. You don't have to actively hate to create an environment that allows hate to flourish. That is, in fact, how hate takes root. It doesn't have enough opposition. So how people may eventually vote, how many people may make themselves comfortable with the idea that they can separate themselves in some way from this man's bigotry so that they can say, I have an economic interest here, I have a political cultural interest here, and I don't necessarily have to agree with what he says and what he believes in order, in order to allow myself to benefit from what he may do for me. You cannot bury your morals underneath your money. Right? The moment that you do that, you, you cease to have morals. OK. Question to the right. Um, hello. Can you hear me? Can someone help? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, hello, Mr. Grove. My name is Javon Hill, and I'm the graduating. Okay. I'll just skip right here. Um, I'm a, my name is Javon Hill. I'm a graduating senior here at Morgan State University, and um, my question to you is: You can candidly like just drag people for filth sometimes, and I I personally love it. But, um, and I was talking to one of the security guards basically saying like, you can curse someone out without using any profound, like, profane language. So 
So like, my question to you is how can you like basically just read someone's entire life without even like kind of using harsh language or anything like that? You're basically just saying what you say. So how do you do that? <laughs> I don't consider that to be what I'm doing, but I appreciate it. I, uh, I hope, oh, my mom wouldn't appreciate that. Um, I, I, I strive to just be as honest as I can be. What, what people don't recognize or understand about the television industry is that most of the people uh, on any particular panel are being paid by the same company. So you're actually coworkers. Right, so before you go out to the channel, everybody's in the same green room. Everybody's getting makeup in the same space. Everybody's chit-chatting. You know, I don't know, you're not old enough to remember this, but there was a cartoon in Warner Brothers. There was like a sheepdog and a coyote. And they would fight and fight and fight and blow each other up and then they would click the bell at the end of the day and they'd be like, you know, they were best of friends. And that's kind of the way it happens on television where people were like, Fight, fight, and argue, and it's like play fighting, and then they go off the, the stage, and they're your best friends. I'm not that dude, <laughs> right? So uh, I'm only going to say what I believe, and, I, and if I believe that, number one, you're lying to the American people, and you're making me sit here and sit through it, that I'm already ticked off, <laughs> right? If I, if I believe that if the, if the host is not calling people on, on this and they're making me do it, I'm doing two jobs and I'm, I'm I ticked off again. <laughs> I believe that if you are trying to convince people that this, that this should be normal, yes. that this bigotry is okay, yeah. I'm li I am livid. I am personally offended. We're not friends. We're not gonna get up and get a cup of coffee after this is over. And I really don't care how you feel about it. It is not my job to protect your feelings. Your feelings are your responsibility to go home and let your wife lick your wounds. I don't care about that. <laughs> my job is that I am trying, this is, this is my country too. And I am trying to protect the place that I love. <laughs> and every time I hear someone talking like that about someone who has talked horribly about Muslims, I'm thinking to myself, I have three kids, and although we're not Muslims, they all have Muslim names. Taj, Iman, the, the, her twin brother, his middle name is Ahmad. I, this, it's, that's, an, that's an homage to the fact that when, um, that, that a third of Muslims in America are actually African American. People don't get this fact. That, that you can't be like, oh, he's just talking about the Muslims. He's talking about you too. He's talking about people that you know. Many of the slaves who were brought to this country were Muslims. I grew up the first three years of my life in a small Arkansas community that was, that was kind of homesteaded by former slaves. You know what the name of this is? Kibla. You know what that's derived from? The directions in which Muslims pray towards Mecca. When, when he's talking about Muslims, I'm taking that personally. When he's calling women pigs and bleeding out of whatever, I have a daughter. I'm taking that personally. When he's talking about Mexicans and rapists and murderers, the first boss I had as an intern who are, I'm still friends with him now, is a Mexican man, and literally the nicest human being ever put on the planet. His name is Angel. I was like, of course your name is Angel, because you're the nicest person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> I take that personally. I, I don't believe that this is a game. Yeah. And people are pretending that it's a game, and, and, and the media is failing miserably to do the job that I was trained it was supposed to do. So if, you, if it looks like I'm on, upset on television, I am. Yeah. <laughs> Sir? Yes. Thank you. Um, well, my question really has to do with something you just said, right? Um, I'm, I'm constantly being I'm constantly in a state of confusion because Trump is so horribly flawed. He shouldn't even really be in the position that he's in. And then it seems like the media tries to make um, him equal with Hillary, tries to make 
Hillary's faults equal to his, where n neither candidate is perfect, but you gotta say one is just way over the top, right? So is that like the media trying to hype up a good football game, trying to, you know, to make them equal so they can keep the hype going? What, what, what is that? Well, I mean, I, 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 I hate, I, let me try to dissect a bit, because I, I hate to say the media, because it's an enormous yeah, yeah. rolling thing, many right. different components, all the way from, you know, you could, you, could, you could make a pitch that even social media is part of the media now because mm -hmm. it disseminates so much information, but putting that aside, it goes all the way from blogs to television to newspapers to magazines to really serious journals to, you know, kind mm -hmm. of frivolous television. But, but this is a part, I mean, I'm teaching a class about this election in real time at Yale this semester, mm -hmm. and, and it's about media and politics. And, and part of what I've been trying to impress upon them is remember this that the media, every, every media outlet you have now, other than PBS and, and, um, and public saying. radio, is owned by a corporation. Right. So they have four, four interests or masters. Mm -hmm. The investors, the advertisers, the, 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 wait a minute, I'm missing one. The audience, which is at the bottom, uh, and the sources, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to have, an audience is bigger, so you have to have a big enough audience to make sure the sources will talk to you, because you, so at a certain point, people will be like, I can't really ignore this call from the New York Times, even if we tell them we have no comment. Right. You, you have to have a big enough audience, so the advertiser will say, okay, we'll pay you this much per page, per ad, per whatever. You have to have enough advertisers to make the investors happy, because if they look at those quarterly reports and say, they're going down too, you have to cut a third of the budget, you have to cut a third of the budget, right? So they have all of these interests competing all at once. Right. And what ends up happening is, is cheap news becomes a very valuable commodity. Okay. Horse race polls, cheapest news you can find. Oh, sorry. Doesn't take anything to do. You don't have to send bodies out. You don't have to interview anybody. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Just put them up. And, the, and there are three trajectories in news. Rise, fall, rebirth. Status, assured victory, none of that is sexy. That doesn't sizzle, that doesn't sell. You need anxiety to sell. It's tight, it's tight, it's tight, it's tight. Somebody's losing, somebody's losing. They've, they've fallen five points, they've risen five points. It's gonna be tight, we have no idea who's gonna win. It's a nail biter. Mm -hmm. That sells, okay. Okay. right? Okay. And now, and there's so many pieces to the organism that there is not one conscience sitting around a table saying, make it sizzle more, keep pushing them close together. That is not happening. And in fact, the lower you go, the actual reporters are just doing their job. They're just trying to report it as best they can. Further you go up that ladder, further you go towards management, towards the people who report to people who, keep, who count the beans, mm -hmm. there can be pressure, and it can be indirect. It can be great report, we got a million hits on that. That affirmative kind of pat on the back is not saying to the person, push them close together, but it is saying, I haven't heard him say anything nice about something I did in six months, but he did say a nice thing about this thing that got six million views, and that was about a horse race thing, about this tight, the race tightening up. That kind of subconscious, mm -hmm. built-in bias towards profit is real mm -hmm. in the news industry. And that is operational right now. Okay, we have Thank another you. question over here. Uh, hi, um, I'm Simone, I'm a junior in strategic communications. And my question is, well, comment first then the question. Um, so I was speaking to one of my friends the other day and she basically said, I'm not voting in this election because I don't care. So for me, it actually hurt my heart because I let her know I'm actually from Arizona and I remember the 2008 election when I packed up my car with my friends, went um, between classes, went to go vote at this small school and when we got to the door, the lady said, you guys can't come in to vote. And that hurt my heart because it, it was because it was a bunch of black kids in a predominantly white um, you know, school in the area. She's like, um, you guys 
you know, just trying to give us reasons we can't come in. And luckily, this gentleman was like, no, they're okay. You know, so I let her know about the situation and how it's very important. So my question to you is, what would you tell the young generation um, that has completely gave up on this election? And because of the discouragement you see in the different avenues of the media and the basically the battle, the, it's almost like a joke. People are seeing it as a joke of this, of this election right now. So what would you say to the younger generation, you know, a reason to get out to vote even though they feel discouraged um, uh, for what they see? So. Good question. Oh, that's me? Yeah. Um, one, a lot of things, because I've run into people who say that they, you know, they're discouraged by both candidates or they're actually four candidates or five candidates, I think, now. Mm -hmm. But they're discouraged by all and they're not going to vote for anyone. I say a lot of things. One is stop looking for politicians to be your saviors. These are not, none of these people are Jesus. They show sure nothing. Uh, that's, not, that's not their role. I don't trust any politician I've ever met, and I've met a lot of them. And I, some of them I like. I still don't trust them. Uh -huh. right? And it's, you shouldn't trust them because they have to do a lot of dirty okay. stuff, shake a lot of dirty hands to get enough money to run. That's, That's just the truth. That's just the reality. But some of them have, at least have their mind and their heart in the right places and at least are aiming towards the right direction, even if they make decisions. Bill Maher said something, you, you know, the late the, the comedy show. He says, you have to know and understand the difference between a friend who disappoints you and an enemy who's trying to destroy you. Oh. Stop looking for perfection. Don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Right? That's first. Second, forget about the, if you can, forget about the next four years. There is right now an open Supreme Court seat. That's scary. That's really Somebody is going to appoint that justice, and he, is, he or she is going to be on for the next 15, 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. That's scary. And he will have a say, or she will have a say in everything that affects your life for the next 15 to 30 years. That is not only about you, it is about your children. Stop being so selfish and thinking it's all about you. Charles, you are. Uh, wait, one, one, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, yeah. In addition, there are 80 plus federal judgeships that are still open. Obama has appointed 40 of them, they never approve them. The other 40 have, don't even have appointments. Most cases never make it to the Supreme Court, they stop at the federal judgeship level. That is where a lot of your, you, if, you're get, if you have the gumption to get up and go out and march for, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter, or if you're cheering uh, Kaepernick for, not, for kneeling, and you're saying you're not going to vote, and you have 80 federal judgeships open who are going to make decisions about all the things that he, Kaepernick is saying he cares about, how much of a co contradiction are you? In addition to that, your vote gains more power the further it goes down the ballot. Is there nothing on the ballot in November that you care about? There is no local race that you care about. There's no local governance. There's no local ordinance that you care about. There's no state ordinance that you care about. There's no state, gov no state office that you care about. Do you care about nothing, or do you just simply choose not to be engaged enough to care? Because the, contra the great contradiction is for you to pretend that you care so much that you could not possibly cast a ballot for this person because you disagree with them on this point, but you don't care enough about your own community that you would go out and cast a ballot where your ballot would have the most strength, which is at the bottom of that ballot. Yes. I don't understand it. I don't accept it. I don't have any patience for it 
at all. Thank you. Just checking to see if that's a pregnant pause. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Hi, uh, Mr. Blow. I follow you on Facebook and Twitter. I, I love all of your stuff on there. Um, along with the xenophobia and the bigotry with most, the most of the white Trump supporters, do you think they also play into the illusion of being, you know, delusions of grandeur, of being like him and his cult of celebrity status that also attracts, because it's like, it seems like daily, the, the Daily Show, time and time again, they interview these Trump supporters, and it's just, they have no clue about anything. They're just in awe of his status and, and his lifestyle and have delusions of being, even the poorest of the poorest of white people in the surrounding areas, they just seem to have this delusion of grandeur and being like him and being all into the cult of the celebrity status of him. So I think it's more of that appeal, along with the xenophobia that they also support. Let me say Trump this. As well. I, I do believe that part of his attraction is personality over policy. Okay. There are no policies. There's like, the AP, I mean, this is not just like the opinion. Like the AP went and looked at how much policy is actually on the website and then how much is on her website. It's not even, it's a joke. It's right. literally a joke. There were like seven policy areas that were on his website when they checked. There's nothing there. There's no record. We don't know how healthy or sick he is. Yeah. We don't know how much he pays in taxes, which is zero, I'm sure. Yeah. But, you know, and, that's, and, that's, and it's legal, right? Because he's the developer. If you ever looked at the, the kind of tax incentives that, they, that are given to developers, they actually get a, a ridiculous number of them. He probably has never paid, and he's yeah. just probably ashamed of it. But he's also probably never given any money out of his pocket. He's probably using the Trump Foundation and the Slush Fund. That's just my belief. That's just my suspicion. Probably. Please, somebody go check that out. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's, yeah. what, that's why this, that is what the, 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 the news reports have been recently about the political giving from the foundation in his name. And maybe he thought that because it was his foundation with his name on that he was giving the money. I don't know what he was thinking. <laughs> Right, so that, that, is, that is a real thing, that was happening, right? But let me just, let, let's back up to a bigger point that is really important to make here. There is an uncomfortably large bigoted population oh, in yes. America. Oh yes, they're also online too. And <laughs> some of them are voting for Hillary Clinton too. Because the, the truth is, the population of people who hold negative stereotypes about people who look like you and look like me, about Muslims, about immigrants, is so large mm -hmm. that it's an impossible to win an election without some of them voting for you. What the data show is just that the percentage of them voting for Donald Trump is just off the charts. But what you as a candidate have to say to yourself is this. Is this person going to be forced to vote for me in spite of me condemning what they believe? Or is this person going to be invited into the door because I am saying exactly what they want to believe and, con and affirming the those beliefs? That's the difference. If you step to a podium and say, this is unacceptable and they still vote for you, I don't have any problem with that. If you step to a podium and do what Mr. Trump has done, which is to demonize people, I have a huge problem with that because you're, act you're actively courting that segment of the population. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. Oh, I know you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I have a question. Um, in the last year, during this campaign in particular, can you think of a time where either you uh, or a collection of sort of like-minded African-American pundits have had a real success? Because in the, in the, and I'll give you a quick example. You know, last summer after the massacres in South Carolina, it, it seemed like there was like a, a private phone conversation where we got on the phone and were like, we are not going to let this conversation be about anti-Christian. Like every black person got on TV is like, no, Dylan Roos a bigot. This was an assassination. Clint Pinckney was, was a, you know, and, and we helped change that conversation, right. at least in that first 48 hours before it went completely off the rails. 
Can you think of some examples this year where either you personally or you feel collectively that like-minded pundits helped move this conversation back to something reasonable as opposed to the ridiculous racist pablum that's been spewing out from most commentators throughout this year? Well, I, think, I guess I would back, back the question up and say, who do I value moving, right? I am of the mind that I don't need consensus because the truth does not need consensus. This truth can stand by itself, but it has to, right? If, if, if the consensus kind of coalesced around the truth, all the better. But that is not my, that is not my incentive. I am not looking at a public opinion polls and saying when I can make a statement and make and be on the on the on the side of the majority. <coughs> Sorry, that's that you're right into the mic. Um, now you can't be president. You just I talk. know, right? <laughs> let me let me go ahead and think. Um, because you, that is contrary to the very construct of this country. It is a representative democracy precisely because they did not want the minorities in society to be oppressed, whether that's geographic or otherwise. So I have no problem not being in the majority opinion on an issue if I believe that it is still the right position to be in. If you waited until gay marriage got more than 50% before you said, okay, I guess it's okay with me. Actually, I'm not okay with you. Either you believe now that it was a moral, a moral and equal right, then it always was. Hold to your spot. Hold to your truth, whatever you believe the truth is, because I'm gonna hold to whatever I believe the truth is, whether or not it is the popular position or not. And so I don't, when I look at whether or not we are moving the conversation, I don't care about trying to fix the defect in the bigot, because that's not my problem. I have things to do. You know, Toni Morrison said one of the great effects, not even if, if it's not even the, the, the intention of racism, is distraction. It keeps you explaining things that don't need to be explained. And all that time you spend explaining that stuff that don't need to be explained, you taking time away from your work, and you taking time away from the people that you love, and taking time away from being with your family. I won't give you that. You've already taken enough. So I don't, I, I, so for me, it really is, it is about language and bearing witness and shaping shaping the language around an issue so that it can be articulated. The truth of it can be articulated for the people who believe that truth, as I believe it. To give them a way to talk about things if they don't already have that language. And that is the only thing that's important to me. Yes, sir. Um, hello, first of all, I would like to say welcome to Morgan State University. Um, my question is the debates that's on CNN or MSNBC, and I watched your debate with Paris on CNN where you um, argue with him, and you have Trump supporters such as him and Boris Epstein, I think that's his name. I don't know who Paris um, is. Okay. Um, who watered down the truth about Trump's record, and when I listen to the debates on TV, it's kind of like a headache that I always get because you have um, Hillary supporters try to state out the facts while they come up with a, you know, a lie or something like that. And my question to you is, what ways can a person such as yourself can get more of the truth out there for people that don't read the New York Times or um, who don't read the Washington Post? Well, let, let, me, let, me, let me say this. All these partisans are lying to some degree. That's why I don't work on a campaign. I'm not supporting a candidate. I just don't like that dude. <laughs> right? So everybody who comes on television 
and they say they are a, a, a support, a, you know, associated with the campaign, they're getting a check for that. They have every incentive to fight and defend that position even if they are wrong. I have to try to separate myself from these people because I'm like, that's another universe of people. I'm gonna still have my check and I'm still be writing when whichever one of y'all lose. Like, you, you, one of y'all gonna disappear from television. <laughs> right? So, that's a separate animal. But I, I just wanna get, get past the notion that, that the truth is, has an ideological barrier. That, 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 that it's all Trump people lying and all the Hillary people are telling the truth. I, that's not the way I read it when I'm on set. I read it as both of y'all are just, you know, this is a game and y'all getting checks out of this. And I'm, you know, I'm not knocking your hustle, I'm just calling your hustle a hustle. For me, there is an absolute truth that, it, that actually exists. And if I can support that truth, then I, I in those circumstances, I'm like, I just, I just can't hear it. I just, I can't, it, it, you, the way you get a headache, I have a headache if I have to leave the set and I realize like, they told 20 lies and I was able to deal with five of them. And I'm like, see, now there's 15 out there floating around in, in they need some bug spray on. I'm like, that's the way I'm thinking about it. And that gives me a headache. But there's, you know, that's how, but that's how, television news is kind of set up. It's not necessarily to deliver truth, it is to deliver the arguments. We have time for one more question. Hello, Mr. Bloom. My name is David Lawrence. I'm a first year graduate student in the journalism program here at Morgan State. First, thank you for taking time out to come and speak to us. I really have appreciated your words here. And if I can bet, and if I can bet to an earlier point that was made about getting out to vote, I came from a hometown in Georgia where less than 20% last year for our mayoral elections came out and turned out to vote, which I really thought was a personal embarrassment. Not to talk my hometown down, but that really is an idea of where African Americans' mind are in reference to vote. With that being said, on to my question, on to my main question here. After the Republican National Convention, I remember reading a quote from Mark Cuban. He said, Donald Trump is really in the presidency for a publicity stunt. He's really not in it to win. And with, this fa and with the facts that you say here, I may have an idea of where you're gonna go with, with the answer, but I would like to know, do you really think that him playing on emotions is him putting his best foot forward? Is he truly serious about the election? Is he truly serious about running? Or is this really something that could be a publicity stunt that, in, in Cuban's words, in your mind, be true as it is? I mean, it's hard, it's impossible for me to get inside somebody's head. I think it is completely possible that, it, that both things could be true, that at some point in, in the beginning, he just thought, why not, you know, more Trump in the news. And, and there became a moment where he thought, I could actually win this, you know? And, and that, uh, what, what people don't put into the stew is that, the, the actual process of campaigning actually changes you. You actually can't go in front of that many thousands of people on a regular basis and them saying that they love you and you are their only hope. And that has an effect on human beings. I don't know how human he is, but it has an effect on regular human beings. Right? So it is very possible that, you know, over the course of the last 14, 15 months, he's gotten to the point where he's like, you know what? I could do it, and I'm very close. And, you know, I changed my team, and Kellyanne Conway is a pollster, and she can help me do it, and I'll read these scripts for the next 60 days, and I won't say anything off the cuff. And what if it actually happens? I'm just a boy from Brooklyn or Queens or wherever he's from. Thank you. We're up against the clock. The president, is that Dr. Wilson standing there? <laughs> we have time for one more question, apparently. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Blow. My name is Lakeisha Mixon, and I am a graduate student in the social work department here at Morgan State University. 
My question is regarding the ongoing conflict between the police department and minority communities. As a conflict that we, I'm sorry, a conflict that you stated, society watches from a comfortable distance, convinced that the battle doesn't belong to them. As a future social worker, a future change agent who is currently working with at-risk youth, can you please give me some advice on what I can tell my teens how to get involved with politics so they can have a voice of their own? How to get involved in politics part of it? Yes. This is very, it's a complicated thing. I, I mean, people um, sometimes describe it as, you know, where do we start? It's a, such a complicated issue. And I always think of it as like starting like the Big Bang. You're just spraying out in every direction, right? Because every one of these things around you has a policy implication. Right. Everything from, uh, from uh, infrastructure and how infrastructure is constructed and whether or not a person can get to a job if it's not near them and whether or not there is public transportation to get them there to, you know, early childhood education and, and universal preschool when parents are having to make decisions about whether or not they can literally afford to take the job with, with the job even covered the preschool if they took it. Uh, from uh, mass incarceration because people keep saying, you know, the high percentages of African American children are born to single parents and yet you're <laughs> sucking hundreds of thousands, millions of marriage age black men out of communities with this program of mass incarceration, of course there are not enough men to marry. And you don't understand that, that you are putting a thumb on that scale even while you're chastising. All, I mean, I can go around this circle and say, they're like all of these policy issues and they're all interconnected. Basic nutrition for children going you, when, when they start school, uh, re-entry programs for people who go to prison and get out, how we deal with drugs in America, and you know, the fact that all kids use drugs at about, marijuana at about the same rate, but black kids are more than nine times more likely to get arrested for that drug use than others. And yet, when we're talking about uh, heroin, which is now plaguing white communities, it, everybody wants to be very sympathetic and compassionate. It's very interesting, right? It is also very interesting that the places, most of the places to this date where marijuana has been legalized are not places with the largest percentages of black people in the states. It's very interesting, right? I mean, we have to think about like all of the reasons that are contributing to our issues and then try to deal with all those on a policy level. And then at the same time, we have to deal with the personal level, which is to say that we have to, continuously in, encourage people to make the best decisions in the position that you're in. Understand that you're, if you are, if you understand that you are under attack, what do you do? The best thing you do is to defend yourself, right? right? And, and have, having people understand that these collection of policies basically represents an attack on you as a culture. And what is the best way that you defend yourself against this, this, this attack? And a lot of that is simply by making the best decisions that you can make. Understanding that you're making those decisions in a context, and your context is, is, is by the nature of, uh, of anti-black bias, going to be different than another person's context. You won't have as much leeway to make a mistake. All of those things are true, but make the best decisions you can make, right? Also, teaching children, creating an environment where children never lose hope and continue to dream and be able to see themselves as beautiful and amazing and able to do and have, and can see a pathway and know that that pathway is available to them. Because none of us has ever met a three-year-old who didn't want to learn everything he can learn. Right. Never. Right. And yet something happens from the time those children are introduced to, to, to structure, powers of structure in our society that robs them of the ability to see themselves flying in this, in this world. And trying to preserve and, and insulate and inculcate that within those children so that they survive childhood yes. is incredibly important. Thank you so much.
Before you leave us this evening, I was wondering if I might challenge you to look around one of those corners that I alluded to in my opening comments and say a word or two about the America you see six months after the election under a President Clinton and the world that you, I mean, the America that you see six months after the election under a President Trump, given the level of divisiveness and bitterness in this presidential campaign that has divided the nation. So what are we, what are we seeing in July, August of 2017 under either one of those presidents in terms of the state of the country? Well, I mean, you know what you're getting with Hillary because she, she's laid it out. She has wedded herself to the Obama policies to some degree and, in, and basically uh, 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 adopted a lot of Bernie's because she had no choice. Uh, and so she's gonna push those. You're gonna get some extension of the Obama presidency. You're gonna get you're gonna get a liberal Supreme Court justice, which would be enormous. I can't even tell you how big that would be because it would shift the balance of power in the Supreme Court for the first time in probably four decades, probably. Uh, but you, you, what's, hello? After the American woman. But I don't know, she, she has not committed herself to, to following through with Merrick Gardner, so we don't know if she's gonna push him. Or if, if she wins, the Republicans would have two months to rush him, to rush his confirmation, and they would do it, I believe, because they're scared of what she would do if, if they don't. Uh, so so you, you understand that. You, you also understand she is slightly more hawkish than Obama, so you're probably gonna get a more aggressive uh, foreign, a foreign policy and the way we in, engage with, with uh, ISIS, although Obama has been super uh, aggressive, you know, fly, flying these uh, paper airplanes and dropping bombs, you know, the drones. Uh, he's been super aggressive with that. Um, so you, you, but there's, there's a policy record there. I mean, there, she says something. The, the, the trick is, what should scare everybody to death? Literally. You actually have no clue what a Trump presidency would mean. He has laid out so few policies. He has backtracked on things that we still don't know what, he's, what his position is. Forget what he thinks he could do. What his position is on the, the population of illegal immigrants. He has said everything. We have no clue what he's going to do. Only thing that we know for sure is he put out that list of 10 Supreme Court justices, and those people should scare you to death. They have promised to roll back everything. So if, if, if people are okay, I mean, to, to, to you know what lady was talking about, like people who said, I, I just can't vote for anybody. If you're okay with living with that level of uncertainty, it gives me a heart attack, so I just can't do it. But if you're okay with that, I guess it's okay to just skip the date. I don't know how it's possible. I don't know how, I don't know how we think about someone who has said these sorts of things about nuclear, I mean, nuclear weapons. I grew up, you know, doing the, the you know, the, the, the nuclear drills. You young people in here, you never did this. We were, we were sure that there was gonna be a nuclear war with Russia and we were all going to die. And we all had to do drills in school and we, you would like curl up in the ball, put your head down, and all this stuff. Like, what is putting my head down gonna do if this is like, near, like Japan? Like, what? That's not gonna do nothing. Like, I actually wanna see it coming. So, but if you've lived with the panic of like, this could be a real thing that happens in my lifetime, and this man is talking about recklessly about the use of nuclear weapons. That should scare you to death. I don't understand this idea that like, oh, but I can deal with it. 
It really doesn't matter to me. That's all I have to say on that. Thank you, guys. As I, uh, as we await Dr. Wilson's arrival on stage for a final acknowledgement of our speaker, uh, I do want to uh, say uh, one thing about uh, our guest's remarks. He, he said, and I'm sure some of you will be quoting him tomorrow, that the truth does not need consensus. Uh, I would add to that, however, in this election year, it does need your vote. Please vote in November, our presidential election. Dr. Wilson. Uh, please join me in giving another round of applause to Charles Blow. Charles, we just have a couple of tokens uh, for you as you leave Morgan. Uh, first, we would like to give you this uh, Presidential Distinguished Speaker Series, Charles Blow, September 14th, 2016, Morgan State University, Growing the Future, Leading the World. I won an Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we have a few... Um, uh, we have a few goodies in the bag here, but one thing we want you... Know you know I can't wear this Wait, 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 wait. No, we didn't say anything about that <laughs> university in Louisiana. Um, but what we want you to do, uh, as you're teaching one of those classes at that university in New Haven, is to wear the sweatshirt of the absolute, hands-down, best university in the United States. I got a picture. <laughs> so once again, a hand of, round of applause to Charles Blow. Thank you very much, Charles.